Okay, thanks. Uh, so this is going to be a talk no, uh, not so much about what we know, but more about what we don't know and uh, ways uh, that we might get around that, I guess. Uh, there's a long list of authors there. All have contributed to the talk in some way, but I'm absolutely sure that none of them are going to agree with everything that I say. Okay, there's a really wide diversity of opinions amongst those people, and uh, that's not a bad thing, I don't think. It kind of uh, keeps us all a little bit honest, I think. Okay. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, four slides that kind of uh, set the scene in terms of uh, where Leoti on my seat uh, taxonomy and classification sits at the moment. The first of these, uh, about classification and phylogeny. Most of the current taxonomy that we have to use is based on morphologically defined taxa, but the morphologically defined taxa and the classifications that are based on those are often not supported by uh, DNA-based phylogeny, especially uh, for these taxa of uh, genus, uh, family and order. Uh, there's lots of taxa, but there's not a lot of data available uh, to uh, deal with them. This data here from uh, genera of fungi um, spreadsheets. Um, the, if you take the leodiomycetes, you take away the powdery mildews, the aerocyphales. This leaves uh, more than a thousand genera, or I should say generic names. Um, about, a, about 175 type species of those genera have DNA available from uh, a specimen that someone identified uh, as the type species. Now, there's, a, there's a lot of faith involved in, in, uh, in using those data as, as representing type species because less than 50 of them have data from the actual type specimen itself. If you trust the person who accessioned the, uh, uh, the sequence, then you know, maybe uh, uh, the situation's not too bad. The next uh, setting the scene slide, these things are ecologically very diverse. They include many uh, aquatic and aeroaquatic hyphomycetes. They include the little uh, cup fungi that you find on uh, fallen leaves, fallen twigs in forests, uh, uh, saprobic things there. They include uh, mycorrhizas, especially of the uh, ericaceous plants, plant pathogens, the powdery mildews, uh, things like sclerotinia, botrytis, uh, and things like uh, uh, codophora-like fungi that um, are pathogens of vascular tissues. Uh, and they turn up uh, often in uh, environmental sampling projects. So, it means you've, so with this ecological diversity, it means that you've got uh, a wide or a number of uh, disparate, more or less independent research groups who have been working on this group of fungi. And these different scientific communities have different needs, so they've developed their own, uh, independently developed their own classification, some based on characters of the sexual states, some based on characters of uh, asexual states. Okay, so as well as reconciling the classic uh, morphologically based taxa with phylogeny, uh, there's a need to link the uh, animorph and teleomorph genera in the sense that they've been used by these different scientific communities. Okay, so that's, the, that's kind of set the scene of uh, uh, some, of the, some of the issues, I guess. Now I've got a couple of slides of uh, what I've called inconvenient truths, um, and I'll just go through these, and some of them I'll pick up uh, during the talk. The first one I think is uh, kind of absolutely uh, key, and a couple of people have hinted at, at this, I think, already this morning. The classifications need to be useful to the users of taxonomy, not to taxonomists. And the second one, a lot of taxonomists don't like to hear that, but in the, um, in the, uh, um, in the, in the kind of science system that I work in, that's an absolute given. If people aren't going to use the work that you do, then no one is going to pay you to do it. The second bullet there, key users, so going back to users, they increasingly identify specimens using DNA sequences. This might be especially plant pathologists. A lot of them don't know how to use microscopes anymore. A lot of them are working with uh, fungi that you actually can't uh, distinguish, or species you can't distinguish morphologically. And uh, it also includes uh, all of those ecologists, people who are not looking at fruiting bodies but looking at mycelium. Okay, so the people who are studying uh, mycorrhizas, endophytes, and uh, the di direct uh, environmental sampling. The next inconvenient truth, uh, the current classifications were developed using morphology, but the groups or clades based on DNA sequence similarity often don't reflect morphological similarity. The next one, the old names, you can't just uh, toss everything out and start again though, because the old names do still matter, because it's those old names that are, are key to accessing all the knowledge that's built up on these, uh, the various species in this uh, class. 
The incongruence between the traditionally used morphological characters and DNA sequences it means we have to deal with uh, polyphyletic and paraphyletic taxa. And I'll just uh, give an example of uh, a quick example of one of those during the talk, and also uh, discuss this a wee bit that the phylogenies that we're using uh, at the moment might not actually be good enough because uh, the tech, because of an in inadequate uh, taxon and gene sampling, and I'll uh, discuss that a bit as well. So when I first started looking at these fungi uh, some time ago. Uh, there were two uh, key uh, books that I used. Uh, one of them was the Discomycete chapter that uh, Dick Korff published in the Fungi, Volume 4A, back in 1973. Another one called the Halotiales of Australasia, published by uh, Brian Spooner back in uh, 1987. Fantastic books and um, absolutely full of knowledge. But neither of those books mentions uh, DNA. The title of Brian's book, Halotiales of Australasia, Geoglossaceae, or Biliaceae, Sclerotinaceae, Hylocyphaceae, uh, kind of uh, illustrates quite nicely the impact that DNA sequencing is having uh, on discomycete taxonomy. Okay, so two of those families, Geoglossaceae or Biliaceae, are no longer in the Halotiales. They're not even in the Leotiomycetes. Okay, they've, they've got uh, different classes of their own. The Sclerotiniaceae, in the sense that Brian uh, used the name, includes uh, species that now we know are much more closely related to Hymenocyphus. Okay, a completely different family. So Brian was actually treating uh, more families than he realised he was treating uh, at the time. Okay, so, but despite these issues, uh, these books were state-of-the-art at the time. They got great descriptions, they got keys that actually work, um, and they're full of uh, familiar names. And this... I think combined with the fact that, the, that these books are struggling to cope with uh, current taxonomy uh, as it's now developing, makes this, kind, this quote uh, kind of uh, highly relevant, especially to a, a lot of people who study these discomycete fungi. The great tragedy of science is the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis uh, by an ugly fact. Uh, but is it the end of the world? Yeah, I'm, I'm not so sure that it's really the end of the world. Inconvenient, perhaps, uh, but these things are just names. And classifications are just hypotheses. Hypotheses are allowed to be wrong, and uh, it's up to us to be able to cope uh, with the changes, uh, changes, especially in names, uh, that we have to um, uh, cope with as hypotheses are shown to be actually wrong. We've just got to suck it up. Okay, so this is uh, an example of one of these inconvenient truths. Uh, groups based on DNA sequence similarity often do not reflect uh, morphological similarity. And an example here, the family Hemiphysidiaceae, described by Korf in 1962. And this was... Uh, is that a pointer? Yeah. One of these things a pointer? Oh, this would be... Uh... This... Genus here, Rhabdocliny, is kind of uh, morphologically typical of Hemiphysidiaceae as, as Korf understood it. So uh, little discomycetes with very reduced fruiting bodies, uh, often uh, developing immersed in the leaf of their host, uh, often and perhaps always on pines, I think. But you look at the uh, uh, DNA sequences in general, like in Coelia, Synangium, Hederia, uh, all are very closely related uh, to Rhabdocliny and other species uh, typical of the Hemiphysidiaceae. You'd have to put all these things uh, in the family Hemiphysidiaceae, uh, something that Korf, uh, with uh, the morphological concept he was using, uh, would never have dreamed of doing. But it's something that we've just got to have to cope with. OK, so you've got these um, morphologically... The, the morphological characters that we've traditionally used uh, often don't correlate with the uh, clades based on DNA sequences. You can, you can uh, resolve this. Uh, you can use phylogeny to help select new sets of characters which are uh, phylogenetically informative, not the characters you're used to using, uh, but uh, different ones that may be a little bit harder to, to uh, observe, uh, but may actually uh, mean something in a phylogenetic sense. So the new morphology. And just, I'll just run through a, a brief example based on characters uh, that were traditionally used to distinguish uh, the teleomorph uh, states of some leotiomycetes. The traditionally used characters were ones that were uh, easy to see and easy to score, or easy to score accurately. Things like hairs or no hairs, gelatinous tissue or no gel or stroma or no stroma. Things that were easy to see. The trouble is uh, they don't often don't correlate very well at all with uh, phylogenies. 
But there are examples of uh, uh, phylogenetically informative characters. And uh, I'll just give, use these uh, two genera as an example, Cyothicula, Crocecreus. Synonymised by Carpenter back in 1981 because um, the sterile tissue at the, uh, at the margin of the, of, the, um, of the fruiting bodies of these fungi uh, were, was anatomically uh, very, very similar. At the time, uh, this was considered a, um, a taxonomically uh, highly significant character, so Carpenter placed these two uh, genera into synonymy. But recent sequencing from the type, spe type species of both uh, genera shows that they are phylogenetically uh, far distant uh, amongst the Leodiomycetes. So this tree on the left here is, is kind of an outline tree that represents the uh, genetic diversity across the whole of the uh, Leodiomycetes. These things are, are way distant. Okay, if you, so if you ignore those uh, traditionally used morphological characters and look a bit more closely, uh, characters that are, can be actually extremely difficult to score, um, or characters that don't kind of jump out as being uh, obviously uh, significant, just, or just kind of hard to see, uh, some of them uh, do appear to be phylogenetically uh, informative. One of them is the uh, anatomy or the, or the detailed morphology of the amyloid pore at the ascus apex. So Crocecrea has a so-called calycyanotype ascus apex, cyothicula, a homenocyphus type ascus apex. Another character, even more uh, 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 kind of geeky, if you like, is the, uh, the structure of the, of the tissue inside the living paraphyses. Okay, so this is a character that's really hard to score. The fungus has to be alive. You can't, you can't score this character from uh, herbarium specimens, but um, in Hymenocyphus and all Hymenocyphus species, I think, uh, they have a, um, a, a kind of a granular looking structure inside the uh, paraphyses, and uh, that, structure, that um, appearance is, is missing from these guys. Ascus apical structure, uh, this is uh, work that's been developed uh, over the years, especially by Viral and Verclay, and uh, it's, it's possible, or these guys think, or uh, certainly uh, Zoro Baral thinks, that uh, uh, this is one of the characters that is going to be key for uh, uh, understanding uh, family-level phylogenetic relationships uh, within the Leotiomycetes uh, using morphology. Whether or not that's right, whether or not that hypothesis is right, we'll probably uh, wait for the test of time, uh, but at the moment it, it kind of it seems to uh, hold up quite well. Skip that one. Okay. Uh, Next inconvenient truth. Morphologically defined taxa are polyphyletic in, in phylogenies. Uh, this is kind of easily resolved with new combinations and uh, new segregate genera. And I'll use a couple of examples uh, from the Rytismatales. Rytismatales is, uh, is, is defined before uh, this paper by Lance et al. in 2011 uh, was polyphyletic. Okay, the, the core Rytismatales are up here, it includes the genus Rytisma, uh, Lophodermium and so on. But there's a group of genera that were traditionally placed in the Rotismatales, Propolis, Cyclonusma, uh, Marthomyces, uh, that were phylogenetically quite distinct. Uh, recently, uh, Burrell uh, proposed the family Marthomycetaceae to accommodate these genera, so uh, that polyphyly is, is uh, kind of dealt with. There's a, a new uh, higher taxon to put these uh, divergent things into. Also in the Rytismatales is a nice example of a polyphyletic genus. Uh, this tree here is, represents the genetic diversity across the, uh, the core Rytismatales. The type species of Lophodermium sits up here in this clade. The type species of Lophodermium is a, a little insignificant little fungus that uh, occurs on the dead, dead leaves of grasses. The Lophodermiums that everyone is interested in are the ones down here, the species that occur on pines, some of them causing quite serious diseases of pines. You can't call these Lophodermium anymore though because phylogenetically they're quite uh, separate from the uh, type species of Lophodermium. In this case, it's, maybe it's kind of convenient that the type species of another genus, Meloderma, also sits down here in this clade. Okay, Meloderma and Lophodermium, traditionally distinguished on the basis of ascospore shape, um, but every other morphological feature and the ecology of these fungi uh, match exactly. It's, it's not surprising at all to me that these uh, pine inhabiting the Lophodermiums and the pine inhabiting uh, Meloderma are uh, phylogenetically very, very similar. So in this case, to uh, resolve uh, this uh, Lophodermium um, uh, polyphyly, it's just a matter of recombining all these pine inhabiting species into the genus Meloderma. 
lots of name changes to deal with, but it kind of resolves the situation. Uh, in Coelia, another example of these polyphyletic genera type species here. There's other species uh, spread throughout the Leotiomycete uh, phylogeny. Turns out that, and this, so this type species sits in the clade with the uh, Hemiphysidiaceae. And it turns out the type has the kind of new morphological uh, characters which are typical of this clade. So that kind of works, it's kind of nice. The, others, the other species will need to be uh, recombined into other genera. Um, sometimes it won't be so easy to uh, find uh, new morphological characters, if you like. Uh, so some of these fungi are extremely morphologically simple. An example of one of the uh, aquatic hyphomycetes <coughs> type species here. There's other species scattered th uh, throughout the Leodiomycete phylogeny. Whether or not it'll be possible to find a morphological characters to distinguish those genera or those species as distinct genera uh, awaits some uh, aquatic hyphomycete person to tell me. Uh, paraphyly. So polyphyly, I think, is kind of uh, easy enough to deal with. Paraphyly is a, more of an issue that people have, and I will uh, just talk about uh, paraphyletic uh, halotiales. Um, so there's a number of orders which have really high value to users, including uh, the Ritismatales, the Tarspot fungi, the Aerocyphales, the powdery mildews, and a few other smaller orders, which uh, make the halotiales, as, it, as, it, as it's used at the moment, uh, Paraphyletic. Okay, does this does this matter? Well, I think it does matter because the Halotiales is a taxon which is really widely used. It's it's uh, it's a name uh, that's uh, often used out there in the literature. But if it's retained in its current sense, this this taxon Halotiales actually con conveys uh, almost no information at all. All it tells you is that your fungus is a member of the Leotiomycetes, but that it doesn't belong in one of these other clades, this Ritismatales or Erythrophales clade. It could be a, um, have a sister relationship to the Fasidiales, it could have a sister relationship to the Aerocyphales, it could be up here uh, near the uh, Hymenocyphus species. It effectively, saying that something is a member of the Halotiales uh, tells, uh, tells you nothing. OK, so how, do you, how could you resolve that? Well, you could just uh, propose a bunch of additional orders. And they might look uh, something like this based on the current uh, phylogeny, so you have a, a Halotiales in a strict sense, you have things like Sclerotiniales, Chlorosaurioales, and so on. Uh, yeah, uh, and, and you get uh, groups of genera like this which have never been placed in uh, the same uh, higher taxon, I don't think. Uh, Melissia, Vibrissia, Phylocephala, Cadophora. Uh, genera which are important for, to different scientific communities for different reasons, either as plant pathogens or as, uh, as uh, highly diverse, uh, very common sets of genera. These things are closely related. It's important, I think, for the different scientific communities who are working on them independently to know that, that their, that their fungus is actually closely related to something else. A higher taxon of some sort uh, would provide that information. OK, so uh, why not just do it? Um, a couple more inconvenient truths. Um, first of all, uh, can the phylogenies that I've, I've been showing really be trusted? That, Probably not, I don't think, for two reasons. And first of all, it relates to genes. Okay? So most of the current class-wide phylogenies are based only on ribosomal genes. So easy enough to resolve, perhaps, by just uh, adding a few more genes. You could do this uh, in a kind of ad hoc way, just use the genes that everyone else uses, go back into the lab and see what primers you have and, and uh, use them. But you could also uh, do it in a more systematic way. And there's a... a a process for, do, for doing this, by, for selecting genes which are likely to be the most highly informative uh, for the questions that you're uh, asking. And so what this process involves is taking all the known uh, Leodiomycete uh, um, genomes, of which there are quite a few, clustering them in some way, searching for uh, single copy orthologous genes, which are of a, a kind of a convenience length for, for uh, handling in the lab, test them for the uh, inf uh, potential phylogenetic informativeness of those genes, select a few that uh, look like they're about the right length, that are highly informative, get a set of primers that will allow you to um, uh, effectively uh, amplify and sequence them. That's it. Um, I've got this last uh, step highlighted because it's actually, uh, it sounds simple enough, but, it's, but we've, we've, tried to, we've tried this in our lab at, uh, at Lancare and it's, it's kind of not all that easy. It's very time intensive to optimise uh, primers and PCR conditions for genes that no one else has ever used before. 
And so I wonder if, you know, maybe we're not quite there this year, but uh, in uh, three or four years' time, if we shouldn't just be, uh, if we shouldn't just maybe even just put things on hold and wait till we can kind of cut to the chase and use genomes. So just generate genomes from the uh, taxa that you're particularly interested in, annotate them kind of roughly, and find and extract the genes that you think are going to be informative for your phylogenies. Or from the talks that we heard this morning, just use a genome analysis, I guess. Uh, so can the phylogenies be trusted? Probably not. And in terms of genes, and also in terms of patchy taxon sampling, we've got issues of uh, long branch attraction, things that sit together on a tree just because nothing else uh, anywhere vaguely close has, has sequenced data available. So they sit together on the tree, they're not really closely related to each other, it's just an artefact of the taxon selection. The Aerocyphales are very rarely included in uh, Halotiales targeted phylogenetic studies, but as the tree show before I showed shows, they sit smack bang there in the middle of the Halotiales. Uh, if they're not included in those phylogenetic analyses, they're likely to be flawed, I think. Okay, you resolve this by uh, adding additional taxa. You could do that in a, in a kind of ad hoc way, but there's also a process for uh, uh, selecting those taxa in a way that is likely to uh, maximise uh, the information that those additional taxa provide. Okay, another uh, patchy taxon sampling issue is that a very few type species of genera and over, even, even, even fewer type specimens have DNA sequence data available. And so, and because most of those genera are very old, means we need epitypes uh, to fix the genetic application of the names. There's a uh, uh, well-documented um, uh, uh, process for epitypification, but the next inconvenient truth is that uh, epitypification is not a trivial task. Okay. It is important because you can't simply abandon the existing genera, because those current generic names, um, uh, they might be phylogenetically uninformative, but they are the key to accessing the accumulated knowledge on those fungi. So it's really important to fix the genetic application of those old genera. But as I said, it's not a trivial task. And I wonder if there's a possible alternative, and don't worry uh, too much about uh, fixing the genetic application of some of the real old names, but rather accept modern synonymous genera as the preferred names for things that are probably uh, groups of uh, synonyms. Uh, using those modern, uh, uh, modern genera, it means that uh, you're much more likely to have DNA, uh, material, or DNA material, uh, specimens available for extracting DNA. And just one example, these four genera are thought to be uh, synonyms. The oldest of them, Mixotrichum, was uh, described with this uh, type species back in 1823, was described from Germany. There's genetic data available from only uh, one isolate of this, uh, uh, identified as this fungus. It was collected uh, from Japan, from soil back in 1997. And, uh, you know, perhaps you could select that uh, culture as the epitype. Uh, it's it's kind of not ideal, because ideally you'd go back to Germany um, and go to the kind of uh, habitat from which this uh, fungus was originally described, look for it, find it again, and select uh, an isolate from that original habitat as the epitype for that fungus. But that's, uh, that's actually that's a really big job. And when you're thinking about that really big job, you've just got to keep in mind that actually genetic data is already available from the actual type specimens of these other three genera. One of those genera, Odeodendron, is, uh, is by far the most widely used of, of those four genera in the literature. Ecologically, it's a very important fungus, and uh, so why not just select uh, Odeodendron as the preferred name uh, for what will be that genus? Okay, so, uh, in summary, um, the way ahead, first of all, find genes. It's kind of simple, find genes for robust uh, multi-gene phylogenies. Select specimens to represent type species of uh, the existing taxa. And then use that data to define phylogenetically robust uh, genera, families and orders within the Leodiomycetes and develop a new classification based on those phylogenies. And that will keep the users who, who require uh, DNA-based uh, identification tools uh, happy. And they're the guys that we've got to keep happy. Um, and then uh, we can search for morphology that support the genetically defined taxa uh, so that we can go, but you know, sometimes it might be more convenient just to, to have a glance at a specimen and say, yes, it's, it's that family or that genus, rather than to uh, uh, generate a DNA sequence. 
it's a big, it's a big job. There's, there's lots and lots of uh, taxa that we're dealing with, lots of lots of genera that we're dealing with, and so uh, as the last bullet there says, uh, it needs a cast of thousands. Uh, there are actually quite a few people working on on these fungi uh, around the world. Uh, uh, some of them, uh, some of these groups have kind of uh, loose uh, collaborations between them uh, with respect to uh, specific projects, but uh, but generally, uh, all of these groups are working more or less independently. Um, as it happens, uh, uh, the projects that they're doing are kind of complementary. No one is doing uh, exactly the same thing. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's quite a few people working on these fungi, and they're all kind of working in the same direction and not uh, in parallel with each other. So that's that's kind of nice. Um, but you know, there's you know maybe uh, 20 or 30 people here. Uh, it's not a cast of thousands, but at least it's a start. But these are the fungi, and, um, and one of the really, really cool things about these fungi is the diversity of lifestyles. And, and those lifestyles are scattered uh, across the phylogeny, so you get uh, sister taxa that might be mycorrhizas or plant pathogens or saprobes or aquatic hyphomycetes. And uh, to me, that makes them uh, ideal candidates for genomic studies for understanding the, the genetics that's controlling uh, the behaviour or the way that uh, fungi interreact, interreact with the uh, environment and the taxa around them. And just look at these fungi, they're really cool things and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's just a group of fungi that uh, lots of people should be thinking about working on. And with that, I'll finish that. <laughs>
many hundreds of cultures that uh, all have ITS sequences available. And when I compare those to the um, uh, doing a bar search on GenBank, many of them will uh, match extremely closely uh, to a set of environmental sequences that match nothing that's you know, related to, that's come from a fruiting body. And just uh, putting those sequences into GenBank would be you know, a valuable start. It's, uh, to me, it's just uh, a lack of time. But I know that there are, that, you know, there's other sets of data out there that people are kind of a little bit reluctant to release for, uh, for their own reasons. But, um, you know, just getting out there is quite a, kind of important, I think. <laughs>